But today, uh, we're fortunate to have Eric J uh, Jacobson. Uh, he is a medical anthropologist and clinical trialist who investigates alternative medicine at Harvard Medical School. He was trained in structural integration by Ida Rolf in 1974 and is current president of the Ida P. Rolf Research Foundation. Dr. Jacobson conducted an NIH-funded clinical trial of structural integra integration as an adjunct to outpatient rehabilitation for chronic low back pain and also worked on clinical studies of the placebo effect. He has served on scientific review panels for the International Fascia Research Congresses and co-authored reviews of fascia research. And Dr. Jacobson, thank you very much for being with us today. And we will hand it over to you when you're ready to put up your slides and begin. Okay, let's see if I get them up here. So are you seeing this now okay? Looks great. Okay. Uh, I want to thank Drs. Gerling and Case for inviting me to do this. Uh, it's quite unexpected. And uh, I regard it as quite a privilege. Uh, and uh, Look forward to being more involved in the Neurons Matter Center. Uh, the, th the title obviously is too vast. I don't think anybody could cover it. So I thought of different ways to cut it down to manageable size. And I just want to say a little bit about how I've done that. So you get some idea what I'm going to do. Uh, I've divided it into three parts. Some problems in research methodology of manual therapies. Some problems, not all the problems. It's not a literature review. It's just three problems that I know something about. Uh, overview of the anatomy and physiology of fascia, which I thought I knew something about until I started really reading the more recent literature. There's a ton of material the past couple of years. Uh, so it's an overview. It's not super detailed. Uh, and then some hypothesized mechanisms of how fascia might be involved in manual therapies. Again, just a few examples. Nothing like a review of the whole field. Um, so if you're familiar with this material, my hope is that you'll see something new or get refreshed about something, or maybe some image will grab your attention. If you're new to it, there's a lot of material, especially when I get into the fascia section. Please don't try to take notes. For one thing, you can watch this thing over and over again because you're going to post it. Another thing, it's very complex, uh, and you can't learn it by taking notes. You just have to find an interesting starting point. And the further you go down the rabbit hole, the more, the more you'll discover. So some problems in uh, manual therapy research. Well, we're familiar with the professional manual therapies, osteopathy, chiropractic, physical therapy. In the EU, they call it physiatry, then massage therapy. Then there's countless pre-professional kinds of manual therapy in Massachusetts here. Every year for the past four or five years, they keep proposing to regulate all of us. Uh, so far, we've lobbied against it every time, but it keeps coming up. And the current version lists Asian bodywork, reflexology, structural integration, Feldenkrais, Traeger, Ayurvedic therapies, polarity therapy, Qigong, body-mind centering, and Reiki. And of course, that doesn't even begin to exhaust the list. Uh, and actually the list keeps getting longer. There's probably a new method of manual therapy invented about once a month, if you could survey the, the world. So how can we classify these things to begin to the hand on them? Of course, there's manual, doesn't literally always mean the hands. It can be fists or elbows. Uh, and then there's instruments. I'm ignoring instruments today. <laughs> just focusing on manual. 
actual body contact. And then it's often a division between bony and soft tissue manipulation. But if you think about it for a minute, you can't uh, push on one without pushing on the other. There's always, uh, there's always both of them being impacted, whatever your intention is. So descri describing what manual therapy people actually do with their hands can be more difficult than you expect. Uh, there's a tendency to refer to hypothesized mechanisms or results when identifying a technique. People say, oh, we're releasing adhesions, mobilizing the subluxations, we're doing articular ligamentous strain, we're doing petroflage, uh, we're doing this or that, but none of that describes what they're actually doing with their hands. Another problem is there's in structural variation. I once served, searched YouTube for videos on how to fix low back pain. It's about five or six methods, each delivered with complete authority, each completely different. <laughs> so there's different camps of people who believe in different kinds of manual interventions to achieve the same end. Of course, there's variation in how individuals perform even a given technique. And as I'll expand on in a minute, there's even considerable political competition within professions and between professions. People get very emotionally attached to their definition of what they're doing. And it's hard to get them to agree. Uh, so Paul Stanley, who's a senior biomechanics uh, researcher who rose and rose in administration at the University of Arizona School of Medicine. And he observed that the research literatures of the different manual therapy professions almost never reference each other. Why is that? So he looked into that. They use different terms for the same or similar techniques and they don't provide translations. So if you're reading chiropractic literature and you're an osteopath, you don't know how to apply it to your field. If you're a massage person, you don't know how to apply structural integration research to your field. So he wrote this quite influential editorial saying we need a Rosetta Stone of manual therapeutic methodology. Now that triggered process that ended up with an extended online conference last year it was actually sponsored out of the AT Still University. It included osteopaths, chiropractors, physical therapists, massage therapists, and structural integrators. Uh, it was online, it was extended, it was several days over a month. It was a big deal. Uh, it had teams of people from each of those professions spent over a year generating preliminary material to answer three key questions. The first one, what do you do with your hands? Now, it sounds simple again, but just within the structural integration working group that I was a part of, it took us about a year to agree on 11 ways that we use our hands in structural integration. In that process, people quit. Sometimes whole groups of people quit. There were some very angry arguments. People get very attached to how their interventions are described. It's not easy to get a group of people to agree on it, especially when it's gonna be presented publicly. So here are two examples of what we came up for structural integration. We came up with 11, but here's two of them. One of them is, many of them were, were general anatomically. They weren't specific to one part of the anatomy. One was spreading from, from a midline, wherever you wanna define a midline in any anatomical structure using fingertips, knuckles, flat of closed fist. You start spreading from the line left to right, and you just keep advancing along the line. The example there is spreading the lateral midline of the torso. Another example, which is more anatomically specific in the field of structural integration, starting from Dr. Rolf, there's this sequence of things that you're supposed to often do at the end of a session. One of them is back work. And so we came up with the description of back work that those of us that hadn't given up could agree on well enough. Uh, 
Uh, some of the other professions uh, were more organized, the professions were more established, although it was difficult to get them to describe what they did. They would like, they tended to name the technique, you know, ligamentous articular strain or cerebral dynamic work. It was hard to get them to really specify what they're doing with their hands. Other professions were so fragmented, it was, they couldn't even agree on what to call what they did, you know, until the very last minute. So another one is force measure. Once you've described what you do with your hands, then the whole separate question is, what about the force? Whether you use your hands or your fist or your elbow, you're applying force to the body in particular directions. The classical three are compression. You're pushing down on the layers. And it's important to remember these are always layers. You're always impacting layers. Whatever you're doing to the surface layer, only part of that is getting transmitted to the lower layers because it spreads out laterally in the structure. Then there's shearing where you're taking a plane of tissue laterally relative to others. Then there's rotation. We're making contact and you're putting a rotational twist in the tissue. Now, one of the problems is that all three dimensions are usually involved simultaneously. So how do you model that? Clearly, uh, it's beyond current technology and there's been a lot of interesting animal model stuff done with this. 15 years ago, I happened to visit the Palmer Chiropractic College and I saw their lab and they already, 15 years ago, had little mechanical jigs where they would put a sedated cat or rat and deliver very calibrated impulses to specific vertebra. Then they would study how the behavior of the animal changed. And there are also some studies, not nearly as elaborate with human subjects, I just wanted to highlight the work of Bill Reed at Chapel Hill, probably the most technically sophisticated recent report. That's a picture of the setup. He's measuring not only the force applied, but he's got sensors inside the animal measuring how the force is spreading through the layers and through the adjacent structures. And of course he's finding that even when the force is aimed at a vertebra, not all the force gets to the vertebra. It gets spread out through all these other structures. So it's a very complex situation. Other obstacles, of course, I already mentioned variation between practitioners. The more sophisticated and experienced the practitioner gets, I think this is true in any of the fields, the practitioner starts to vary their force and the vector in real time as they're feeling changes in the tissue. So how do you model that? Maybe, you, maybe eventually you have a glove with sensors on it that can sense the force that's coming out of the point of contact. Uh, and then you've got to do some kind of very fancy modeling of that. Now, I also wanted to mention the ForceNet Center, which Bill Reed is one of the principals in at Duke, it's one of the U24 centers that was funded at the same time as the Neurons Matter Center. Now, I also had some, was lucky to be part of the placebo research group for many years. And placebo effects are very well evidenced, both clinically and mechanistically. At this point, it's surprising if you look at some of the reviews, the detail of the mechanistic understanding at the level of individual brain regions and how they're responding and contributing. Now, of course, most of that is in the field of drugs and acupuncture. And I understand why care is taken to exclude acupuncture from manual therapy, but there are very robust findings in those fields and those findings should not be excluded so I'm thinking about these comparable effects in manual therapy. It can't be that there are completely different mechanisms in manual therapy than in some of these other processes. Now, one of the things we explored in the placebo group 
was that patient-therapist interaction could significantly alter the magnitude of placebo response. And the major way we did this was the clinical trial of acupuncture for irritable bowel syndrome. We picked irritable bowel syndrome because it has a very high rate of placebo response in, in drug studies, one of the highest of any disorder. Uh, and I can't go through the whole study, but we divided it into three treatment groups. Wait list, uh, I don't mean to do that. Wait list, no treatment, only occasional check-ins with study staff, because we wanted to limit the social interaction. Limited interaction, they come in for acupuncture, they get sham acupuncture, and they get a very brief interaction. Not hostile or cold, but cordial, but brief. Not a lot of talking, not a lot of hand-holding. Augmented interaction, we actually did a review of the literature on social effects that enhance placebo response. And it constructed a menu of behaviors for the augmented interaction. And the acupuncturists had to train themselves to deliver those behaviors. And we actually monitored it with video and rated them to make sure they were delivering them. And then, of course, as you might expect, the outcome was that the augmented interaction had the biggest placebo response, significantly more than limited which was significantly more than weight rest. And we found that on all four patient-rated outcome measures that are <coughs> dominant in the field of IBS research. So it was a very robust study. It's had a lot of influence. Now, the same phenomenon is this acupuncture, but I'm sure the same thing happens in manual therapy, that the patient's response depends a lot on the, their experience of the relationship and the social contact with the therapist. Uh, third topic under manual therapy research problems, devising credible placebos for manual interventions that involve force is very difficult. Credible means that the patients can't figure out whether they're getting placebo or the Verum treatment. And from my own experience participating in a number of these placebo trials, a lot of patients get very involved in trying to figure out which they're receiving. They do little experiments, they come to conclusions. So if you're successful, the guesses in both the real arm and the placebo arm are 50-50. If you're not successful, then a lot of people figure out which treatment arm they're in. And that's presumed then to reduce the magnitude of the placebo effect. Because a lot of people think, think, oh, I'm just getting placebo. Then they don't expect to get as much of a change. So some strategies. Use subjects who are naive to the experience. So they don't know how it's supposed to feel. Uh, so another one that has been used a lot. I haven't reviewed all these placebo manual therapy studies, but there are several. And... Typically, they replicate the same placement of the patient and the same placement of contacts. And they even involve a little movement, but they use no or minimum force in the placebo group. And hopefully, if the patient's naive, they don't know what to expect, so they are more likely to believe that they're getting a real treatment. Here's an example. This is from the laboratory of Nathalie, I can't pronounce French names, God Roulet in Sherbourne, Canada, uh, one of her postdocs uh, devised this placebo, direct myofascial release technique. The verum was delivered with moderate force. The placebo was with the same position of hands, but no tension applied between the hands. So the expectation there is that especially if the patients were naive to the intervention, that that was a pretty convincing placebo. Another one that I've heard, I have some colleagues here developing, very clever, is to, you have your manual therapy treatment, the very one and the placebo one, but then you distract the patient. You deliver, a, you would, in addition to the manual therapy, 
you make some excuse about it and you say that what you're really interested in is this other therapeutic device, either electrical or magnetic and make it have blinking lights or it makes a sound. So they really think they're getting something. And then if they're distracted enough by that, the hope is they won't get too involved in trying to figure out, you know, whether they got placebo or real manual therapy. That's being used by people, has been used by people and is being used more. All right, so fascia, I'm a little bit behind on time. Uh, I, if you look at PubMed and search uh, fascia research, you get one of the little graph in the upper left-hand corner. It's almost flat until it gets to the 1990s and then it just goes exponential. For a long time, there was virtually no research on fascia because it was regarded as the stuff to get out of the way so you could see the important stuff. So I'm going to go through the anatomy, histo histology, a bit of physiology. Again, it's going to be complicated. Don't try to remember it all or write it down. Just see what strikes you. And then you can start there and go deeper. Now, I'm following Carlos Stecco, who spent 30 years doing fascial dissections at the University of Padua. And she published this incredible book, which is filled with photographs of fascial dissection and micro photographs down to this cellular level. It's, I think, the authoritative work. So I referenced it a lot. So there's the extracellular matrix. It has two components, ground substance and fibers. Ground substance, water, hyaluronin. I'm learning how to pronounce that. It's a very long polymer, thousands of polymerized units, extremely long. And then other glycoaminoglycans that are only hundreds of polymerized units. And they're both hydrophilic, but hyaluronin is very hydrophilic. There's also endocannabinoids, there's also hormones, there's all kinds of things in the ground substance. I already mentioned the hyaluronin is very hydrophilic, something like up to 10,000 times its volume in water can get attached to it. Uh, so that makes it very variable in viscosity. It can be very slippery or it can be very sticky. Uh, if it gets very sticky and stays very sticky, that's called densification. Uh, there's also a long standing, at least 100 years, back to AT still at least, 1899 hypothesis that the movement of water through the ground substance is key to the nutrition of all the tissues in the body. Now, how would you test that hypothesis? But it's very long standing. Fibrous components, collagen, it's mostly all collagen, 25 different types. Some of them are thicker, more fibrous than others. It's a triple helix of polypeptide strands. Each helix can include multiple types of collagen. How com complicated can you get? Then there's elastin, which is also a polypeptide, but because of its molecular structure, it forms coils. So in its traction, the coils can unwind and lengthen. And when the traction is released, it can recoil. So it makes the tissue more elastic, the more of it there is. Fibronectin is also kind of elastic and it forms mesh-like support structures. There you have some illustrations at the bottom of the collagen triple helix and some of the other fibrous contents of the matrix, the extracellular matrix. Now, this is Robert Schleeps. He's a German physiologist of fascia. Beautiful pie chart of the comparative volumes of the extracellular matrix. You can see that it's just about one third fibers and two thirds ground substance. So it's mostly this gelatinous ground substance with fibers in it. I like to think of it as a biological fabric. It's really not primarily, primarily cellular. Cellular components, fibroblasts. There's a nice photo of fibroblasts from way back, 1971. They're sensitive to all kinds of signals. They secrete all kinds of stuff. If you look at the upper right, they're secreting the, the peptides that turn into collagen fibrils, 
peptides that turn into elastin, enzymes, growth factors, hyaluronic acid, and all these are varying depending on how it senses its environment. They can move around through the matrix. They're not stationary. They can differentiate into what are called myofibroblasts when there's a mechanical signal or an immune signal. Myofibroblasts, as you see in the illustration, send out pseudopodia in all directions, and they actually grow actin filaments in those pseudopodia. And they can extend those pseudopodia, and there are little molecules that latch them on to the ground substance, and they can pull themselves along. They can actively crawl through the fascia. Here's a nice uh, photograph of the fact that if you stretch fascia, the cells in the fascia expand dramatically. And that was the basis then, I think expressed in this same article, uh, that it's the hypothesis that if there's a lot of stretching and these fascia are expanding and sending out pseudopodia, you, they can, there are photographs that show that the pseudopodia contact each other. So it could be a singling network through large regions of the body. Myofibroblasts, I already explained that. I already explained they're key, they're key in wound healing. They migrate towards the wound and they send out pseudopodia and grab each margin and pull them together. Fascicytes, Carla Stecco, bless her heart, discovered a new kind of cell called fascicytes. The article's 2018. They are little round structures that are located at the interfaces between dense fibrous and loose areola fascia, and they secrete hyaluronin. And the more lateral shearing that happens where they are, the more they secrete. So if there's lateral shearing, they make the ground substance more and more lubricated and more and more glidy. Helocytes are kind of strange cells. They're not that well understood. It's a nice picture, but if you look in the upper left there, that telocyte by the arrow, that shows the long extensions they have. They have very long extensions that, that uh, are hypothesized to send signals to remote parts of the tissue. Neural components, myelinated. To save time, I won't read through all this. Bikinis, you know, there's a lot of them in the skin. Rafinis, stretch receptors, there's a lot of them in the skin. Golgi's are very important, Golgi tendon organs, because they are telling the motor cortex what the state of stretch of the tendons is. Uh, so there's a long-standing hypothesis that if the tendons get too dense and inelastic, then there's not that much stimulation. The neuromotor system doesn't have that much information about what's happening. There's autonomic afferents that sense the immune status, they sense the sympathetic parasympathetic activations, and they feed that information up to the brain. So the, the brain knows what the status is of the fascia. Unmyelinated fibers, this is interesting. They're mostly mechanoreceptors. Robert Schleep, that German physiologist that I mentioned, he took some histological data and he calculated out and estimated that in the average human being, there are between 150, 250,000 mechanoreceptors in the fascia. That's many times more than all the other neuroreceptors in the human body. So his hypothesis is that that is a big influence on how we experience ourselves, how the brain constructs its understanding of our state in relation to what's going on around us. There are also nociceptive fibers in the fascia. Immune cells, I won't go through it all to save time. Other cell types, these are extruded through the capillary walls. They're reabsorbed to the lymphatic system. Here's another beautiful pie chart by Robert Schleep showing that almost all the cells in fascia are fibroblasts. There's a little bit of immune cells, a little bit of nerves, a little bit of other cells. And here's a summary of Robert's pie charts. You can see that in fascia as a whole, it's almost all extracellular matrix. 
which means the ground substance and the fibers, then you see to the lower right that it's mostly, the matrix is mostly ground substance. It's about a third fibers. And then you see the red pi that the cells are almost all fibroblasts. So you get a picture that this is a biological fabric. It's mostly gelatinous ground substance and fibroblasts and fibers. Not that the other contents aren't important because they're all sending out signals. They're all changing each other's, what each other's doing, which is you're beginning to appreciate how complex the whole thing is, which is why nobody really understands how all these things interact. At this, and most they understand about maybe two or three of them interact in certain situations. Fascial anatomy. Now, there are many schemes of categorizing fascial anatomy. It, it, when I studied Rolfing in 1974, the, the only fascial anatomy we had was dated 1931, and it was in French and had not been translated. So we could look at the pictures, but between 1931, in 1974, there wasn't any significant fascial anatomy done. Now there are people who specialize in it. I've named three of them there. I already mentioned Carla Stecco, Frank Willard, Andre Vleeming. Frank Willard has one of the simplest but most provocative schemes. He calls it a fas 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 cunculus. A cunculus is a suffix that means a small model a small simplified model of what he calls the fascia proper. It's tubes within tubes, the artificial. So to the right there, he's graciously allowed me to reproduce this. Uh, you can see the outer gray level is the superficial fascia that wraps everything. Then there's the axial fascia, axial in blue, there's also appendicular fascia. That's what starts in the shoulders and hips and goes out to the limbs. It's in the mature adult, they link up. It's one continuous system. Frank's very interested in the embryology of how the fascia develops. There's visceral fascia, which surprisingly runs all the way from the nasal oral pharynx, all the way down, involving all the organs, all the way to the anal region. So it's a whole continuous system that communicates force and God knows what else between all those tissues. Meningeal fascia surrounds the brain and spinal cord. And he puts, because he's interested in embryology, he's got the notochord, which in the adult becomes the vertebral column. Then there's loose or areola fascia, which Frank doesn't count as fascia proper. And that's subdermal. It's right under the superficial fascia. And it's all the spaces between organs and between muscles that aren't immediately wrapped in fibrous fascia are filled with this wonderful glistening cobweb of loose areola fascia. I wish I was good enough to embed a YouTube link here, but I couldn't do it. But I encourage, if you never have, go to YouTube and search Jean-Claude Gimberteau. Strolling through the skin, he's a French hand surgeon. He's got wonderful micro photographs of the areolar fascia moving in amazingly various ways. There's deep fascia, mostly in sheets. Some of it, especially the paramuscular, is the, the collagenous fibers and the other fibers are oriented along lines of force. But there are also fascial structures that are just aponeuroses that cover big areas that aren't subject to as much mechanical strain where the fibers are a little more random. Here you see a cross section of the human thigh. You can see the superficial fascia, a layer of deep fascia that wraps all the structures under it. Then each muscle group has its own fascial wrapping. In a minute, we'll see the detail of how there's wrappings within wrappings within wrappings there. And then the uh, dark crimson section is a cross section of epineurium, which is the fascia that wraps the major nerves and the, the blood vessels wrapping. And then around the blue, which is the bone, is the periosteum, which is 
like fascia, but it's very, very, very tough and it's anchored to bone. But that is what tendons attach to. They attach to the periosteum. Uh, what can go wrong? Fibrosis, acute injury or chronic strain. Anybody that does manual therapy is familiar with fibrosis. Parts of the body that are incredibly dense and fibrous and corrugated, and it's difficult to change them. But the more you succeed, the more flexibility the individual gets. Adhesions, uh, as I mentioned, uh, adhesions have been, you know, for at least 120 years, people have been talking about adhesions and releasing them. There's a nice picture of adhesions, collagenous adhesions between fascial layers. The paramuscular myofascia, the endomysium wraps the little individual bundles of, of uh, myoactin units. Then those bundles are bundled to the paramysium. Then it's all bundled by the epimysium. And there's a very fine regulation of the gliding potential between those different layers so that the muscle, all those things can combine and exert force, but they also can slide and glide past each other. Epimysial force transmission is a very beautiful concept and piece of work, originated by Peter Hewing, a Dutch biomechanical researcher who showed very elegantly that if you, if you stimulate the motor nerve of an individual muscle, you get force in all the tendons of the muscles that are adjacent to it too that the force is transmitted through these fascial wrappings. Mechanotransduction, you probably all know about this. Uh, it's a nice illustration, especially when you think that it came from Shutterstock, uh, but it shows how the fibers in collagen link to molecules called integrins in cell walls, and they transmit actual force through the integrin assembly into the endocytal skeleton of the cell and they change the biochemical activity in the cell. So anything that a manual therapist does to change the elasticity or the mix of the fibers is going to change the metabolic activity of the cells in that region, if not body-wide. Now, whole body communication topological continuity is it's not like one piece of it's not like the fascia of your bicep starts at one end and ends at the other fascial sheets are continuous through big areas and the organs and the muscles live in the envelopes between those sheets so any manual therapist is familiar with the idea that if you do something to the fascia in one locale often there's a traveling response to a remote part of the body. Sometimes you just see it. Sometimes the patient says, oh, I feel that in my other shoulder. I feel that in my leg. And you can't always predict. But it's a one interconnected fibrous network. I already mentioned the article, Abbott and Langevin, with the hypotheses that myoblast pseudoprotea might be a link in a body-wide network. Now, there's two very influential models of body-wide myofascial geometry that are rationalized biomechanically. Dr. Roth, of course, there you see her model of the little boy, what she called the random body, what she called the organized body. And that line is the line of gravity. And that was her criterion for biomechanical excellence. Tom Myers, who was a student of Rolf's and of Buckminster Fuller, came up with another very influential model called anatomy chains. Can't remember how many there are. I think there are at least 12. They're fascial continuities of biomechanical force through the body. Those are just two of them here that are illustrated. And his book, Anatomy Trains, is I don't know how many languages, and he keeps updating it. And each time he adds more and more research in the appendices. So it's a real resource if you haven't looked at it. Uh, small fiber mechanoreceptors. I already mentioned Robert Sleep's hypothesis. And then there's little explored and hard to think of how you would explore hypotheses that there are piezoelectric effects through the whole body. 
that there could might be some kind of electromagnetic resonance to the fascia in the whole body. So those are hypotheses. Yeah, I'm doing pretty well with time. Now, I wanted to give uh, two, four examples by two research teams of very meticulous, beautifully controlled research on manual therapy effects on fashion. I mentioned the long-standing belief that there are such things as adhesions and that a manual therapist can release them. Jeffrey Bove and his associate Susan Sapel, who was an expert masseuse, spent a long time developing a very carefully standardized model where they could create visceral adhesions in the abdomina, abdomina of mice. They confirmed very carefully that they were there to save time. I won't describe how they did it. And then Susan would do fingertip rolfing of the mouse tummies. And they would confirm surgically that the mice that got the fingertip rolfing had a dramatic in decrease in adhesions. Uh, and later studies, they've started to show that there was also a dramatic decrease in inflammatory biomarkers in the treated mice versus the untreated mice. Very beautiful. Uh, and then eventually, I don't know if it's a 2017 publication, they collaborated with a group at Temple uh, with Barbie and they did the same thing. They developed a standardized model of that manual therapy that Susan could actually train other people to do it. So it was standardized intervention. And the Temple group was very sophisticated about measuring inflammatory biomarkers, and they had the same outcome. Then, Bove with Barbie collaborated on developing another model where they got rats to press a lever over and over again to get food pellets. And they permitted it to they permitted the rats to do this for so long that they would their arms their paws would get stressed out their arms would get stressed out they'd get painful they it would get them hard to move it they'd exhibit pain behavior uh, and again I have those dates there I can't I didn't want to give the whole references but there's so many there's five at least five articles on that and then once he had it going on his own he and Barbie collaborated and they found not only you can see the graph that then they treated they treated the mice the the stressed out arm with manual therapy again they standardized it and the treated rats their arms got much more functional they didn't show pain reactions when the arm was touched and there was a dramatic decrease in inflammatory biomarkers beautiful work showing that you can have adhesions and fibrosis and that they can be relieved by manual therapy Two more models. This is from the lab of Helen Langevin, uh, one of her postdocs, Lisbeth Beruda. Uh, again, beautifully controlled work. Uh, part of a whole series of studies, there must be five or six articles from that lab about the effects of stretching pig models and rat models uh, once the tissue has been inflamed or promoted to, to become dense and inflexible. In this study, carrageen induced inflammation of the lumbar fascia treated with passive versus active stretch. So you see A, very beautifully controlled. They just put the, put the rat on the table, nothing else. B, the table flexes and passively stretches the lumbar fascia. C, they lift the tail. If you lift the tail, they discovered Helen well, Langevin's lab discovered this effect, I think. If you put a rat so that it's four paws on the edge of a shelf or a table, and you lift the hind legs or the tail, the rat won't let go. It'll stretch out its lumbar section and be very long. So this is colloquially called the rat yoga model. And then you see in graph E that they, they used ultrasound to measure the thickness of lumbar inflammatory lesions and no stretch, 
was significantly thicker than passive stretch, was significantly thicker than active stretch. Beautifully controlled experiment. One more. Yeah, I have time. This was so great study. Again, Liz, Lizbeth Baruda. Stretching inhibits mammary tumor growth in mouse breast cancer model. Very justifiably got into nature. I already mentioned there's a whole series of Langevin lab studies of the effects of stretching thoraco, thorac, thoracolumbar fascia, rat and mouse, and in fact, pig models too. Female mice injected with mouse mammary tumor cells, very nicely controlled. They bought the mice that were genetically bred to get mammary tumors. They didn't use those mice. They extracted tumor cells and injected them into normal type mice. So this was there was no confounding about the physiology of cancer. Then they're randomized to stretch versus no stretch. Again, controlled for handling. Not a lot, 10 minutes a day for four weeks. It's not a lot of stretching. There you see the same rat yoga model. And you see that the volume of tumors in the stretched mice was very much less than in the mice that had no stretch. And over time, both stretched and untrashed, stressed stretched mice gradually got more tumors, but the rate of increase was much greater for the no stretch. Beautiful work. Well, those are the two best examples I know. There might be others, but I just happen to be familiar with those two sequences of work. Illustrate how very careful work can be done about the effect of manual therapy and stretching. I mean, if you're a manual therapist, you stretch things. You know, you grab two ends of a fascial sheet and you stretch it. So it's the same, same effect. So just let's review for a minute. Uh, manual therapy research problems, replica replicability of interventions. How do you describe your intervention? How do you measure the complex force vectors and magnitudes that are compressive, shearing, and rotational that are varying in real time? Big challenge to instrumentation, big challenge to complexity modeling, credible placebo blinding for force-based manual therapy is difficult because you can't really have a placebo that feels exactly like the actual force intervention. It's not like pharmaceuticals where you just have, you know, the pill and one has the drug, one has sugar. We talked about fascia is highly complex and continuously adaptive system. It's not just the tissue, it's a whole system, multiple interacting components. Nobody understands the totality of how they're all interacting. And there are hypotheses, multiple hypotheses that the interactions extend to the whole body. Hypothesize manual therapy mechanisms. Some are substantially evidenced, Others with very limited experimental evidence, some very long standing. I mentioned some from AT Still, 1899. It's interesting to note that most of these propose one or at most two systems responding to the intervention. Like you're stretching the fascia, you're measuring the inflammatory biomarkers, you're looking at adhesions. But we've already been through the fact that there's so many other components of the fascial system and how are those other components interacting? So it's a very substantial challenge to complexity science and probably ripe for artificial intelligence. Just thanks to my mentors, Dr. Rolf, who started me on this whole thing 45 years ago, Helen Langevin, who was an early mentor when she was up at the University of Vermont, Ted Kapchuk, who was the founder of the placebo research movement and for many years has set up a placebo study group at Harvard Medical School. Peter Wayne, who's currently the director of the Osher Center at Harvard Medical School. 
Paolo Bonato, who directs the Motion Analysis Laboratory at Spalding, he let me do my K1 study there and donated a lot of resources. Effie Kokoto at the Neuropeptide Laboratory, Beth Israel Leahy, you see all those numbers after Effie's name, she understands probably more about blood biomarkers than anybody that I know. I think we have time for some questions. Excellent. Um, absolutely, we have time. Would anyone like to kick it off first? It's a lot of material, but I wanted to just give an overview of how complex the whole thing was. I'll, I'll start with one question. Uh, several times you referred to modeling needs for, um, you know, at the tissue level and so forth. Um, with so many different structures of, of um, where you've got ground substance, which would be modeled one way, fibers which would be modeled another way, where do you begin? Yeah, you mean mathematical modeling? Mathematical modeling, right. I have a friend who's a full professor of biomechanics at McGill. He's been there for, I don't know what, 10 or 15 years. His whole, his whole personal thing is just to model the spine and pelvis and the ligaments connecting the bones. That's a 15 year project. So to model the other stuff, I mean, it's what I said, it's a big frontier and it's very complex. I can't tell you how to begin. You're the engineer. I think you have to begin in pieces and then see how the pieces interact. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's very difficult. Part of the difficulty is how do you measure ground substance phenomena in living human subjects where you can't take biopsy samples and, you know, and microphotograph them? You have to use some kind of imaging. And how do you look at that stuff in real time? Fluid flows, densification, changes like that. What do you feel are the most important aspects if you were going to begin an effort in that area? Uh, so we've done I've done work with skin, modeling just epidermal, dermal skin, interactions between those two, and some of the lower levels of subcutaneous fat. Uh, but that doesn't take into account anything with respect to the fascia that you mentioned and the multiple layers. Uh, and the skin is hard enough with those different layers. Yeah and with different um, anisotropic properties, uh, where different directions pull different ways, different ge geometric features have an impact as well. But I was, you know, I'm thinking about, uh, you know, this is neurons matter. So thinking about where the, where the afferents might lie, where the afferents might be firing. Um, Maybe there are, are regions there that would be ripe for modeling. Yeah, there are two things about that. One is there are a number of uh, incipient methods of manual therapy that are very superficial, that uh, involve identifying areas of the dermis that are stuck to the underlying fascia not the deep fascia, just the superficial fascia, and doing fairly low force manipulations of those areas and getting very dramatic effects in terms of, of movement limitations from injury. So the question is, what's happening there? It's clearly a neuromotor effect, but it's being triggered by such superficial manipulation. The other thought is, uh, the, every three years is a fascia research congress. It's a big deal. There used to be about 700 people there. We're up to like the sixth one now. It was in Montreal. And I just happened to look at a poster where someone had ultrasound imagery of the dermis, the subdermal fat, and the areola fascia, and then the superficial fascia. And, and they could demonstrate vertical connections between the dermis and the superficial fascia. So when you do something to a piece of skin, it's already mechanically transmitting whatever's happening neurologically. 
So it's not an answer. It's just things that need to be explored. <laughs> Francis. Uh, thanks, Eric. All I can say is blimey, yet another confusion for all our, all our somatosensory neuroscientists. You said that the fascia is innervated by low threshold mechanoreceptors, yeah? Yeah. So there's no conscious perception of the fascia being stimulated. So what are they doing in terms of being there? We have these patients, as you know, neuronopathy patients, you don't feel touch. When you give them a massage, they don't feel anything. So clearly their fascia is probably still innovated. So what's going on in terms of these nerve fibers? You know, I'm, I don't have a good enough memory for brain areas, but Robert Sleep has a very interesting discussion. He got very interested in this. It's one of his major hypotheses that those unmyelinated sensory nerve fibers do not go to the sensory motor cortex. They go to higher brain centers and they end up being linked to what are they called? The prefrontal cortex, which integrates the sense of the social sense of self with the bodily experience. So they're not necessarily conscious. They might potentially become conscious, but there's so many of them, 150 to 250,000, that Robert's hypothesis is that what's going on with them has a big influence on how people feel about themselves, even unconscious. Yeah, I mean, yeah, it's fascinating. I mean, that level of innovation clearly has, is not there as a waste of time. But it, yeah. So, yeah, okay. It's a puzzle. Yeah. You neurology guys have to figure it out. Yes, boss. <laughs> I don't know anything about neurology. I'm hoping to learn a lot later on in the neurology course in Indianapolis. Well, this smacks of our, our obsession with these low threshold C fibers in the skin, you know, the, the C tactile afferents. Uh, and they likewise don't project, as far as we know, to primary somatosensory areas. They go to limbic structures or paralimbic structures like the insula. Um, so, we need to find out where this dense innovation ends up in the brain. You got any ideas, Hawkan? <clears throat> no, I mean, uh, um, Laura might know. She, you you actually done the um, fMRI of deep pressure. I've done fMRI was... of deep pressure, yes, um, but not 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 distinguishing stimulation of, of fascia. And that's something I would love to do. So we did an initial study um, using a, a, a compression sleeve from a lymphedema boot. And we uh, used air compression to um, repetitively squeeze a limb, creating a, a deep massage pressure-like effect in MRI, because you can't bring your massage devices that are electric into the MRI. Um, and we saw a lot of mid insula activation, um, a little bit, a little bit different than the C tactiles. Um, <laughs> but there's a there, there's a lot. I, I would love to figure out what techniques are um, most preferentially activating, <laughs> simulating uh, fascia versus muscle versus skin and, and do some fMRI comparing those. I know, I know they can't be isolated in a living human, but um, clearly there are techniques targeted to each of those tissue types. And it would be really interesting to compare. Do you have kind of a, a broad strokes um, summary of, of what the main differences are in the techniques that seem to be activating fascia versus muscle or targeted at <laughs> fascia versus muscle because a lot of the massage techniques involve you know compression and shearing and yeah. Yeah. Part, part of the problem is that each profession and sub-professions have their theories about what their what their intervention is doing yeah but that's not the same as knowing what it's actually doing and you probably all realize this but one of the biggest mistakes through the history of medicine is to say, well, this is my hypothesis. And when I do X, 
I get why some of my hypothesis is proven. No. <laughs> I think when people get that defensive, Eric, because they don't know what they're doing. So they, when you poke the bear, they thrust back, you know, because no. they don't have a mechanistic understanding. So they get very um, heated about anybody criticizing what they are doing. As your research uncovered, there's so many different factions all basically trying to get some kind of IP within yeah. their own therapy. But basically, they're all touching people. Last year, there was an, I think it was NCCIH sponsored, I think it was two days webinar about imaging and myofascial pain. The first day was researchers and clinicians. The second day was these incredible high-tech imaging engineers talking about very fancy multimodal imaging of the body and of fascia. So I wonder if it's not already possible or not far off to get imaging of neural activity in fascia in living people. I have to go back and look at that second day. It was very fancy stuff they were talking about. Okay, other questions? All right. Um, thank you very much, Eric. Uh, this is a great <clears throat> overview. Um, in fact, I was thinking, I don't, Terry, I don't know if we invited him to the summer school or not, but this should yes. be, this should be mandatory, a mandatory presentation, in fact. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Um, and I, yeah, I was just thinking that too. And I'm wondering if we can use our recording as, as even something that people need to watch before they come. Might be a good idea. Yep, I'll be there. I hope to learn a lot. Um, if there's time, I was kind of hoping to maybe talk a little bit more about that um, about that uh, concept where the um, the neurons are like instead of going, to, they actually go to the prefrontal cortex, and um, I just kind of I I just I don't know. I think that that's a really interesting concept, especially when we're considering how, um, you know, people experience pain versus like their concept of how they fit into the world and how fascia kind of plays into that. And um, uh, so I don't know, I would just love to hear um, all of your incredible brains kind of talk a little bit more about it, if anybody feels up to that. Um, <laughs> I'm just a lowly massage therapist that works at the VA in the St. Louis, uh, Missouri area. So this is really exciting uh, for me to hear uh, multiple different perspectives in that regard. Well, Francis Orhoken or I can speak to kind of see tactile efferents and their projection um, more to the uh, insula than to primary somatosensory cortex. I think that is, um, there's a lot of strong convergent evidence for that. Um, and, um, are you attending summer school? No, unfortunately, my um, anxiety got the best of me and I never fully submitted the application. So, um, not this year, but I'm going to try for next year. <laughs> okay. Um, you'll, yeah, you'll see tactile affluence will sort that one out. <laughs> I think there's a lot, a lot of evidence that this gentle, and the, the thing about your, you mentioned, Eric, is, is that the, the pressure activates all kinds of receptors. The see tactile affluence are exquisitely sensitive to the lightest of touch, almost that you wouldn't feel. So it is a separate input, which will not be affecting any mechanoreceptors in the fascia. Uh, but they do regulate and they do regulate stress systems. Um, I mean, there's a can of worms here that you've opened up. Thank you very much. We all... <laughs> <laughs> Forget about the fascia. <laughs> a big can of worms. It's going to take. It is, a, it is a can of worms, but uh, I mean, I'm also more interested in in, in early development. You know, preterm babies, term babies. You know, what's the fascia doing in the very early stages of nurturing touch? kangaroo mother care, all of the other aspects of touch that we're obsessed about with the skin. But then, of course, you've got the bloody fascia. <laughs>
coming in left center. <clears throat> you would be interested in Frank Willard's article in the volume that Robert Sleep edited titled Fascia. It's, it's all about the embryological development of the fascial system. Well, that's where to start, isn't it? To look at development. I had one personal anecdote that's related to this, I think. I didn't realize it until we had this discussion, but I recently had a, a series of episode, delightful episodes of kidney stones traveling down one of my ureters and taking their time. That kind of pain is much more emotionally disturbing than pure musculoskeletal pain. Mm. I really felt... You know, I thought about mortality and the end of my life and I was worried and disturbed. It's not the same as, as something just musculoskeletal. Maybe it's connected to what you're saying about where the C fibers go. No, I think that's a really interesting observation in terms of the quality of different pain. It really gives away an awful lot about what's going on. Those who experienced childbirth, I'm sure, have a similar comparison between that kind of pain and you know breaking a leg um, you know again these are all clues as to function I think I'll go and read a book on fascia I think <laughs> Carl Stecco's work is amazing it's not just photographs and anatomy he's got long chapters of the cellular content what the cells do it's really a monumental work and Robert Schleep's now in its second edition anthology called Fascia. Some of the articles are speculative, but there's some very solid science in that volume. Liz, was there any other question you had? That, I, that was the one thing that really just like stuck in my brain and, and like got me really wondering, you know, so um, that was the biggest kind of like, hmm, kind of moment for me. So thank you for entertaining that. <laughs> Rick, do you have leads on um, the references for the projections of the fascial innervation? I know I've seen something on that, but. Uh, I would look at Robert Schleep's uh, articles about that. Yeah. He's a, he's a big advocate of that hypothesis. He's not a brain scientist, but I'm sure he's getting it from some references. Okay. Hi. Um, do we have time for one more question? Sure, sure. Uh, so thank you all for putting this together and thank you, Eric, uh, for your talk. I, so I believe someone mentioned recently they were interested in early childhood development. Um, uh, so I'm uh, the massage therapist at Comer Children's Hospital, at University of Chicago, um, and working with premature um, infants um, and also infants with neonatal abstinence syndrome. You can imagine a lot of very difficult sensory processing issues while they're in the hospital and after discharge. And I'm wondering if there's any um, research uh, examining the kinds of uh, intervention that would be most appropriate from what we know from fascial science um, in that age. I don't know if that all came through or not. Yeah, not that I know of. Good to see you, Dylan. Thank you for the talk. Yeah. Francis, do you have, I don't know if you had any comments on that. Uh, I have an extensive research project looking at the role of gentle touch in preterm infants, <clears throat> mainly to establish the fact that how important that stimulation is for epigenetic development in the brain. And there's a lot of stuff out there from Michael Meany and Francis Champagne stuff, looking at the role of gentle touch in I've always thought that the input to give that brain a sense that it's got a body, because obviously skin and brain are developmentally connected. Um, I just, I've always ignored the fascia. Thanks, Eric. Always, <laughs> I've just looked at the skin and these wonderful C tactile afferents, because babies that don't get that touch develop a lumber of neurodevelopmental disorders. As we know from the Romanian orphanage babies, Harlow stuff, 
you know, touch, gentle touch, is doing something quite profound uh, to brain development that uh, I've never factored in that the fascia may be part of the orchestral maneuvers, so to speak. Mm -hmm. Okay, any other questions? Sounds great. Thank you very much, Eric. We really appreciate it. Thanks very much, Greg. Yeah. Thanks, Eric. See you, everybody. Thank Ow. you. Eric, uh, I just sent you a, a chat about summer school. <laughs>